Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be looking at the final part of Girl Defined's second book, Love Defined, Embracing God's Vision for Lasting Love and Satisfying Relationships. This is, thankfully, the very last part of this book, so once this is over we can take a nice long break from Girl Defined and just not think about them for a really, really, really long time. As always with this series of videos, you don't need to have watched the previous ones to watch this one, but if you do want to, I'll leave them linked in the video description below. A little bit of admin before we jump into the meat of this book and start ripping it apart. Um, you might have noticed there has been a little bit of a gap in my uploads recently, and there is a very, very, very good reason for that. Just last week, I was at Glastonbury Festival with the wonderful ladies of Herd Collective, and I was there to perform some of my original poetry on stage with them and it was such an honour. We performed on the Toad Hall and the Mandala stage and even though there's some of the smaller stages in the Green Futures fields, it was just some of the most magical moments of my life. <laughs> the poem that I performed was an original one called Room, which is about my personal choice to remain child free and, and how there's still so much stigma around that and why so many people still want to control my body and can't respect my choice. But on a kind of wider scale, it's just about reproductive rights in general, specifically those of people with uteruses. And honestly, it could not have happened at a better, more important time. We actually headlined the Toad Hall stage the night before the Roe v. Wade thing was repealed in America. And it just felt so important to remind people that people with uteruses should have control over their own bodies. There's no ifs, no buts, no what if, this, that, the other. No, we should have control over what happens to us what happens to our bodies, what grows inside of us, we should be able to control that. If you're interested in the poem, I do have a really rough version that's just me reading it in a hotel room, available over on Patreon, but I am working on a much nicer, proper recording at the moment with like a video to go with it and everything, so if you be a little patient, uh, you can stick around and check that out soon, and uh, if you're not already, then subscribe to be notified when it's out. Um, it's a poem that I've been working on for a good six, seven months now, and I'm so happy that I'm finally getting to perform it for people and share it with the world, and it's something that's really, really special to me and that I hope helps a lot of people. So yeah, there you go. Okay, let's jump back to the video. So if you don't know, Girl Defined, they are two sisters, Kristen and Bethany, who are fundy Christians who create content for teen girls and young women, mostly around the topics of biblical womanhood, and dating and relationships and how to wear makeup in a godly way and all that jazz. Although they probably don't like jazz, do they? So for a recap, in the first parts of this book, uh, we saw a whole host of really, really bad stuff from them and a tiny but not quite redeemable sliver of useful content as well. On the positive side, Bethany gave some really great advice to single women about not just sitting around and waiting for a man and to make sure they still do something useful and fulfilling with their lives before they get married or if they never get married. Uh, I thought that was really good and there were definitely some positives in there. Overall it wasn't too harmful. Good stuff! Sadly that's pretty much where the positives end. <laughs> Not even joking. The rest of the book is filled with a crap ton of homophobia about how the only real couples are one man and one woman. Uh, there's a lot of really disgusting transphobia about what it means to be a real woman and we won't get into that, but you can see it in the videos if you can stomach it. And there's a lot of really harmful stuff about how there's only one way to have a relationship, how you need to stick to traditional biblical gender roles, how women should never let a man know that they're interested in them, and to make sure you settle for basically whatever man wants you. It's an absolute mess, and today we're jumping straight back into the middle of it. <laughs> Sometimes! <laughs> I'm so glad you guys are here with me so I don't have to read this stuff alone. <laughs> and if you're wondering, well, you're an atheist, why comment on this book at all? I gave a really long explanation as to why I think it's important to talk about books like this, even when I'm not necessarily the target audience. That's in, I think, part three of this video series, so if you're thinking about asking that question, go watch that video first, please. If you're not thinking about asking that question, let's jump straight into chapter 12, which is titled, Qualities to look for in a future husband. And I feel like this is the one we've all been waiting for, right? Let's find out what Girl Defines dream man is, other than Jesus. So, to preface this chapter, I do think it's very important to know what qualities you're looking for in a partner, what core goals and values you need to have shared, what goals you each want, and, and so on. And I actually spoke about this in quite a bit of detail in another video of mine, which I'll pop on screen now and link to in the video description. And while I think some qualities and stuff should be universal, for example, be with a partner who respects you, I think we can all agree that's necessary in any healthy relationship. I also think that there are some specific qualities you look for in a person 
that should be incredibly personal to you and that are going to be very very different from anyone else out there. These are something that you need to think about for yourself and really consider and not just check off a list from a book, you know? You can't be like, oh well I should be with him because Kristen and Bethany say he's right for me. You need to think about these things for yourself and figure out what's right for you. Now if you've seen the other videos before, you might remember that Girl Defined made a earth shattering breakthrough in one of the earliest chapters and if you weren't around to see it, this might shock you. Apparently who you choose to marry is just as important as actually getting married. I know, who'd have thunk it? Wild. Well, since they made that bizarre, bizarre discovery, it's pure madness, um, they then go on in this chapter to continue to blow your mind by saying that apparently you actually have to think about who you want to marry and not just jump into vows with the first somewhat cute guy you see. This is truly life-changing stuff. They say, choosing a husband will be one of the biggest decisions you will ever make. Taking this life-altering decision lightly is one of the worst things you can do for yourself. Choosing who to marry is a decision that should carry a lot of weight. The two of us are grateful for the wisdom and input our parents gave to us throughout our teenage years. They regularly encouraged us to consider the type of man we wanted to marry. They challenged us to think about our lives 10, 20 and even 40 years into the future. What would we value in a future husband way down the road? What qualities would we want in a father to our future children? Would cute looks and a hot body be our number one priority? Or would we look for something more substantial. What is this madness? An adult actually having to think through their decisions? It's, who makes this stuff up? While I... I can see why this is so shocking to some people. <laughs> No, but th this stuff is common sense, right? And I do find it slightly bizarre that they kind of paint it as this big revolutionary thing, but ultimately I'm happy that they are saying it because it's important and I guess some people do need to hear it. So, what does a man need according to Girl Defined? Well, first up, spiritual vision, of course. Because as they say, how is he going to lead you and do it well if he doesn't have a spiritual vision for his family? Kristen then goes on to say about her now husband, he had a vision to serve the Lord and I knew I could get behind him and follow his lead. Here are a few practical questions you can ask a future husband prospect. Where do you want to be in 10 years from now? How important will church be for your family? How do you see yourself leading your wife spiritually? What priority will ministry have in the life of you and your wife? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? They say, look for a man with passion. And I thought maybe this is something I can get behind. I love a passionate man. Men tend to talk about what they're passionate about. If they're passionate about football, they'll talk about it. If they're passionate about food, they'll talk about it. If they're passionate about girls, they'll talk about them. If they're passionate about the law, Lord, they'll talk about him. And I'm like, yeah, this sounds pretty good. I love it when a man tells me stuff that he's interested in. There's nothing more beautiful than a person whose face lights up when they're talking about something they love, right? I think we can all appreciate that, but not girl defined. They only want one kind of passion. They say, when it comes to a potential husband, you need someone who is passionate about the Lord. And they imply he should be passionate about only the Lord. Then they ask a bunch of questions about this, like you need to ask your future husband, if God isn't the center of his life, then how will he lead and love you. <laughs> and they say, if he's not passionate about God, what will motivate him to want to stay by your side as you grow old? How about his love for you? His loyalty to you? The fact he cares about you? The fact he enjoys his life with you? The fact he wants to continue building a life with you and enjoy the life you've already built? A man shouldn't need a metaphorical gun to his head from a deity to want to spend his life with you. And if he does, I'm not sure that's the healthiest relationship, I'll be honest. They then say you should look for a man with purpose. Finding a man who understands his purpose is crucial. If your guy doesn't understand his God-given purpose as a Christian man, he will constantly wander and never find a compelling reason to live. He will never find true satisfaction in life and will always be on the hunt for greener grass. A lot of these points are just very, very similar. Point one was find a spiritual man who thinks about the future so he can lead you. Point two was find a spiritual man so he can lead you. And point three here is find a man who thinks about the future and is spiritual so he can lead you. They're the same thing. They're saying it in different ways, but they're all the same thing. I mean, even look at some of the reasoning, right? In point two, if your man isn't religious, then what motivation does he have to stay with you? And then again, in point three, they're asking, if your man isn't religious, then why would he want to stay with you when he could have something else? They're the same point. 
They're saying you need these three qualities in man, spiritual, vision, passion, and purpose, but they're all the same quality when you look at their definitions of them and what they mean for your relationship. It's not a list. It's the same point, but they're trying to reach a word count. How uncreative and thoughtless you have to be to not even be able to come up with three distinct characteristics. Uh, this is something that I don't think I've really touched on so far, but it really came up a lot when I was reading this last passage, is just how much of this book, and just honestly a lot of their work, is lazy. It's quite sad. And then in the study guide portion of this chapter, they offer a list of qualities and ask the reader which are most and least important for your future husband to have. And it's a very, very bizarre list. Some are incredibly vague, such as having a great personality. What does that even mean? What I think is a great personality in someone is going to be completely different to what the next person thinks is a great personality. I love someone who is smart and creative and I can have in-depth conversations with them and is kind and honest and that's a great personality for me. But then the next person along might value a man who's witty and is and practical and a problem solver and think that's a great personality, you know? So an important quality, but a vague one. And then quite a few are incredibly shallow. And I think the point is that they're trying to get women to say, oh, well, this isn't important to me at all because I'm like super religious and mature and I don't need a pretty boy. I think that's what they're trying to get women to say. But, so they list things like handsome face and big muscles. And I know that they're trying to be like, these are so shallow, you don't really need these. But honestly, I do think it's really, really important to be attracted to your partner, <clears throat> Kristen. I remember when you were walking down the aisle to Zach and you whispered over to me and you were like, I'm not attracted to him, but I'm right. going for it. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think it's important to acknowledge that what is attractive to many is not attractive to all. So they put very specific characteristics down here. And I don't think that's what everyone's gonna find attractive. Like what Kristen and Bethany define as a handsome face is probably not, I would, not what I would think of as a handsome face. Like I personally don't really care for muscle and I prefer, prefer men who are a lot slimmer. So on this list here, big muscles would be very low on my list of priorities, but not for the reason Kristen and Bethany want me to put it down there, you know? I would also probably put beards at the top of my list. I, I love a man with a good beard. Long hair is also a bonus, but I would bet, regardless of if we were listing qualities or things we find attractive, Kristen and Bethany would not be putting those up there because look at their husbands. I think we have very, very different tastes in men. <laughs> so. The, the point that I'm trying to make, all silliness aside, is that I find it very interesting that they included these very specific physical characteristics because once again, I think it shows that they're incredibly narrow-minded and can't see that other people have differing values and needs to them. I think they even find it hard to believe that different people find different men attractive, vastly different men attractive, well, just different people attractive. I don't think they can get their head around that at all, can they? And then some of these qualities are just really repetitive. Um, like if you look at the list, I'd say that faithful and pure, loves Jesus and involved in church are all different levels of the same characteristic of just how religious are they? They're just different levels of that, you know? So it's an odd list, that's what I'm trying to say. Moving on, we have chapter 13 next, which is titled, What to do when he comes calling, which I think sounds a little bit ominous, but apparently it's a good thing. Uh, this one opens with some major cringe, I'm gonna warn you now. I try not to be too petty in these reviews, um, sometimes it's hard, especially when they write about the most mundane situations like this, like a cheap rom-com. This is like something out of a really, really bad Hallmark film, and that's not something to aspire to. You've dreamed of this moment as he walks towards you, your mouth goes dry. You've talked to this guy dozens of times after church, but Something feels different today. Something big is about to happen. As he gets closer to you, your heart starts pounding. He strikes up his normal cheery Sunday conversation. He seems extra excited, maybe even nervous. You chat about the sermon and the latest happenings. Then he strategically changes the conversation. He shares how much he's enjoyed getting to know you over the past few months. He says he likes how much you have in common. Then, he speaks the words you've been hoping for. The words you never thought you'd actually hear. With a smile that melts your heart, he tells you how much he admires you. And then he expresses, he would love to get to know you better. Your heart does a somersault inside your chest. You pinch yourself to make sure you're not dreaming. No, it's real and it's happening right now. I mean, it's quite intense for what in reality was probably more like, all right, I'd like to get to know you better, love. Fancy it. <laughs> now, we don't really have any complaints about the content here, just how poorly it's written. Like, it, it's bad, it's 
really, really bad. Um, and the thing is, like, I don't know how much I can really blame Kristen and Bethany for the bad writing that is throughout all of their books, because, I mean, they were homeschooled for a lot of their life, they've not exactly had, like, top quality education. Plus, have you seen the books that they read? They went through a stage on their channel of doing these videos where they would recommend, oh, these are the books they've been reading this month. Um, but I think they stopped after a while because it was probably a lot of effort because they actually had to read the books. <laughs> but for a while they were doing a lot of book recommendations and I have read a lot of the books that they recommended, mostly for content and content content ideas and just general trying to educate myself on what the other side thinks, and most of them are terribly, terribly, terribly written. There's one exception, and that was Jackie Hill Perry's Gay Girl Good God, which is a stunningly beautifully written book with an absolutely horrific message. It's basically about a woman saying that God stopped her being gay, and you can too. It's pretty horrific, terrible, terrible book, beautifully written. That woman has a real talent and she's wasting it, which is sad. But that one aside, most of the books that Girl Defined recommend are really, really, really badly written. And I get the impression that they refuse to read a lot of secular books, regardless of how good the writing is. So it's not surprising to me that they write in this way because I think they have picked it up from the kinds of books that they read, which are not to be cruel, just to be factual, written by poorly educated people who aren't very widely read themselves. So they do have this same style as a lot of other authors writing in this genre, who it's like a little insular bubble where they all read each other's stuff and they all pick up bad habits from each other. So on the one hand, it's not surprising to me that they write this like this. Honestly, they are better than most in the Christian book writing world, but not nearly as good as everyone in the grand scheme of things. Do, do you know what I'm trying to say? Point is, doesn't surprise me that they write like this, don't know how much I can blame them, but it's still disappointing and hard to read. All that aside, this is the first time I've seen any hint of nuance or open-mindedness in Girl Defines content, and it's really great to see. They point out that in this chapter, we're not gonna give you a step-by-step -step system for what your relationship process should look like, Every relationship will have different variables. There's no one size fits all mold. That is the first time they've acknowledged something like that and I was starting to be a little impressed until they ruined it by basically saying, well, actually, no, there is one right way and it's our way. Not even joking, they, they literally say, there's not one right way to do this, except to quote them, there is a wiser and more Christ-centered way to go about things. We want to show you how to practically navigate your relationship for God's glory. The goal of your romantic relationship should be to bring God glory. The purpose of your romantic relationship should be to discover whether you and this man should get married. And if you do get married, the goal of your relationship should be to display a beautiful picture of the gospel. So there's not one right way to do it except this way. Each decision you make will take you either closer to your end goal or further away from it. By choosing to keep Christ at the center of your romantic relationship now, you will lay a strong foundation for your future marriage. And I don't know what I'm doing with my hands, I'm so sorry. Um, if this aspect is missing, your relationship will be built on sinking sand. You will become consumed with self. Uh, this might be really, really great from some people, but from a purely personal perspective here. Oh my God, they make dating sound boring as hell, don't they? <laughs> Kristen then gets us to ask, before you enter into a rom romantic relationship with a guy, I highly encourage you to ask yourself these three questions. One, is this guy a genuine Christian? Two, are we both mature enough to enter into a serious relationship? And three, could I see myself potentially marrying him? Of which the last two are actually quite a good idea if you are looking for a serious long-term relationship. Although I would offer some tweaks in general. So for number one, I would change this to, do my core values align with my partner? Something we briefly spoke about at the start of this video. And also something that I've spoken about in depth in this video, if you wanna go check it out as well. Number two, I think, is fine as long as you ask the same thing of your partner too. Is your partner also mature enough to enter into a serious relationship? Really important thing for you both to consider. Um, and as for number three, I don't hate it, but I would change it to be more inclusive to could I see us building a life together or something like that. Because, and again, only if you're looking for a long-term serious relationship. 
because a long-term relationship doesn't have to lead to marriage. There are many other alternatives, you can go down many other routes, but I feel the one universal thing is simply, can you see both of yourselves working together to create and live the kind of life you both want? And I do think that's something that's really, really important to ask. So what's really bizarre to me is that Kristen then goes on to say how she answered yes to all these questions, she absolutely could see herself marrying her then friend, now husband, Zach, but then she admits that when she answered these questions, they barely knew each other. So how can you know you wanna build a life with someone when you don't know anything other than surface level things about them. She says that only after deciding that she could marry him one day did she let herself get to know him. Very backwards, isn't it? So she writes, we didn't pair off and immediately dive into romance. Instead, we built an intentional friendship, which was different from the casual acquaintance-like friendship we'd enjoyed in previous years. This was a really fun stage. We didn't know each other very well, so we started off simply getting to know each other's core values and beliefs. I think that's a really great, healthy thing wonderful, no complaints there. Since the relationship was at the beginning phase, we didn't want to cloud our thinking and judgement by being overly romantic. Our motto for this stage was romance to a minimum, friendship to a maximum. Um, but despite their weird order of doing things in terms of, you know, like deciding she could marry him and then getting to know him, <laughs> there's actually some really good stuff in here. So for example, you know, the core value bit and then this next bit that says we asked each other lots of good questions and we had a total blast doing it. We discovered that what each other believed about God, theology, family, the future, success, values, convictions and much more. These intentional questions really helped Zach and me get to know each other on a deeper level. And yeah, I think this is absolutely really good advice. I don't personally see why they had to put a romance bow on things in order to do that, but you know, whatever works for them. If that's what they wanted, if that's what made them happy, if, if that's what was healthy for them, then good on them, I'm not gonna judge at all. Kristen doesn't do the same though. <laughs> she absolutely judges anyone who does things differently to her. So she writes, in this modern day and age, the friendship stage of a relationship is usually skipped. Couples jump straight into romance and physical affection before building any sort of foundation. They isolate themselves from all friends and family. They seek very little outside wisdom. As a result, the couple begins to feel in love long before they truly know each other. This usually leads to regrets and backpedaling further down the road. Kristen has this habit of doing this where she's like, if you ever do things differently to her, you will definitely end up unhappy and you can't possibly have real love like she does. It's a bit ridiculous and offensive. And like, I get that Kristen wanted to wait for romance and sex and that's what worked for her, but not everyone wants that and that isn't gonna work for everyone. For some people, romance and sex and knowing if you have physical chemistry with someone and knowing that you have that intimate relationship and you know them on that intimate level, they're really, really important parts of getting to know someone for some people and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It should absolutely be up to each individual and each different couple to decide what they value and what they wanna explore in a relationship and when. There's no one right or wrong. Some people might want to wait and postpone these things. Some people might not want them at all if they're aromantic or asexual. But for some people, they're really, really core parts of getting to know someone and core to what they value. And there shouldn't be any shame in that. It's absolutely okay to do what's right for you at your own pace in your own relationship. And then there are more questions to ask the man that you're dating. And these are all very similar to the qualities in the last chapter. Again, it's all quite repetitive. This is what I mean. They reuse a lot of the same elements from chapter to chapter. Not so much in a callback kind of way, more in a we're trying to meet a word count kind of way. I was gonna read you some of these questions, but then it turns out there's an appendix with even more questions. 50 of them, in fact. So we're gonna look at some of them instead. Some are genuinely pretty good things to be asking. For example, why do you wanna be in a relationship with me? What does your vision of a happy family look like? Why do I like him? And what do his priorities reveal about his character? I think that's super helpful, super important. Also really good to be asking those things about yourself, all good. Some are just very oddly specific and feel like bad exam question. For example, what are the last five spiritual growth books you've read? What's your favorite book of the Bible and why? Who is your spiritual hero and why? What is your understanding of biblical womanhood and what's your understanding of biblical manhood? Use scripture to make your point. <laughs> I, just, I can just imagine like that being brought up on a date, like they're sat there having coffee and she's like, use scripture to make your point. <laughs> I love it, it's great. <laughs> Some of the questions are absolutely steeped in really subtle misogyny, like this one, in which Kristen and Bethany encourage you to ask the people who know him, so like 
his parents, his mentors, family, friends, people at church, ask them, would you encourage your daughter to get to know him? And then there are some, I think, that are just very narrow-minded. What's really interesting is that there's no questions about, like, how well does he treat you, is he respectful of you, all that sort of thing. But Kristen does want you to ask yourself how he treats his mum and dad. Not you, but his mum and dad. Like, I, I get that sometimes in general you can tell a lot about a person from how they treat others around them, but you absolutely cannot base everything on family. Not everyone comes from a good family and just because someone doesn't speak positively about their parents or have a lot of contact with them, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a flaw in them. Maybe they just had a crappy family. So, while I get the point of like, you know, looking at how he treats others, I find that this is a really, really narrow-minded way of wording that and asking about that. Of course, what is frustrating about so many of these questions is that it's really, really clear that to Kristen and Bethany, in their minds, there is only one right answer to most of these, which is really, really frustrating, but mm -hmm. Then in this chapter, there's more about Kristen and Zach's relationship and how it progressed, like him starting to buy her flowers after a few months of getting to know each other. And they talk about how they avoided being alone in cars and houses together in case they just couldn't help it and just had a little smoochy smooch. And then she talks about them challenging each other with difficult questions and them having shared values. And I'll be honest, this does actually sound like a really healthy and positive thing for them. So no complaints about that, all good. Um, but the way she writes about it also just makes it sound really really dull which is a shame it like it sounds like she's describing the process for applying for a job not dating the love of her life you know i don't see any joy or passion or excitement or fun in any of her words and it's really kind of sad i hope there was all of that and i hope it was there and maybe like kristen just doesn't know how to write it but it just very dry <laughs> uh, the only real emotion she displays is, is when she very briefly describes her engagement so that's really nice she says, with the sun setting over the beautiful Texas hill country, Zach got down on one knee and asked me to become his wife. As a gorgeous diamond ring sparkled in front of me, I looked into his brown eyes and couldn't imagine spending my life with anyone else. With tears of joy streaming down my face, I emphatically said yes. After a big hug, Zach put the ring on my finger and we just stood there soaking in this incredible moment. So that's really sweet. That's quite lovely. And then immediately after that, it's straight back to the pragmatic and I wanted to serve God with him, my parents approved, and we did premarital counselling and read God books together. <laughs> so, way to kill the romance there. Then on to chapter 14, this is titled Romance Without Regrets, and we open with Bethany telling a heartwarming, beautiful, wonderful, happy story about her Nazi ancestors. I'm not joking. Basically, they tell a story of um, hiking up a mountain in Austria and they try and make it this like analogy for life about how, you know, they needed guy ropes but they got to the top eventually, blah blah blah. The analogy is fine, the context is not. If you want to tell this story, you could tell it about hiking up any mountain. It doesn't have to be while you're out there exploring your Nazi past, you know? Bethany decides to add this little detail into the story. Since our maternal grandma, Nana, is native Austrian, we'd been dying to visit her homeland for years. This was our first time there. Nana was born and raised in a quaint little countryside town called Salfelden. Gonna warn you now, I am terrible with most European pronunciation. I am just, I'm bad at it. I'm gonna blame being from Yorkshire because we don't even speak English properly, but I'm useless at it, I'm sorry. Can't get my tongue around so many of the sounds. It just doesn't, doesn't work for me. Austria was more stunning than we ever imagined. Not to mention the outrageously dis delicious food. Oh, Wiener Schnitzel, we miss you. It's fine, right? Lovely little context. Grandma was Austrian, grew up in an Austrian village. You know, Austria is a beautiful country with a really rich history. And I mean, a lot of that history is dark and disturbing. Um, but what does that have to do with Kristen and Bethany? Except the fact that their family was on the wrong side of that dark, disturbing history. They caused it. Their sweet little Nana, who was born in this quaint little village, was actually the daughter of Johann Groschlecker? Le 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 I, 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 this guy. I'm so sorry. And he was a member of the Nazi party from 1925 onward. He was arrested a number of times for participating in Nazi rallies until the part of Austria that they lived in was annexed by Germany. He then, thanks to his many, many years of loyalty, was made mayor of this quaint little village and he threw a giant Nazi parade celebrating and welcoming Hitler. And it gets worse. 
because he knew the townspeople so well and he'd lived there for so long, uh, he was also likely involved in helping round up Jewish people from the village. He was involved in helping identify them. He signed the documents for them to be taken to concentration camps and a number of other atrocious acts. If you'd like to know more, there's a blog post about it here which compiles most of the information about it and everything like that. Yeah, he was a horrible, horrible man and he was their Nana's dad and she was living in the village while all this was happening. Now, can Kristen and Bethany help who their ancestors are? No, not at all. Just because their ancestors were a Nazi, it shouldn't reflect badly on them, right? Except, if my great-grandfather was a celebrated Nazi, I would not be visiting the town where he helped capture and kill thousands of people. I wouldn't be writing cute stories about my Nana visiting the Nazi town she grew up in. And I definitely wouldn't be posing next to his gravestone and posting it on social media. If this was me, and I didn't agree with his Nazi tendencies, let's say, I'd be distancing myself from that part of the family as much as possible and doing everything I could to educate myself and other people on why their actions were wrong as hell and doing everything I could to make up for it. Like I say, I wouldn't be writing cute stories about this and posing with his grave on social media like he's some kind of hero. So I don't care that she's trying to use hiking up a mountain as a metaphor here, I care about the context you're telling this story in and making it seem like, oh, a cute little thing, we visited this little Austrian village uh, where my great-grandfather was a Nazi who killed people. I'm sure that's not the only hill they've climbed in their life. If they wanted to use this metaphor, there was absolutely no need to bring their Nazi history into it and make it seem like some cutesy little thing. Um, and then to change his tone slightly, they start talking about how to avoid having sex before marriage because we all know that's the worst thing you can do in your life. Way worse than being a Nazi, right? Uh, they offer three strategies for pursuing pursuing purity, and these are exactly as you expect them to be. The first is just memorize scripture and it gives you some bible quotes to learn, which is just whatever. The second strategy is to establish boundaries, and this is very interesting because in theory I am all for this. Boundaries? Amazing! We love them! Everyone should know and establish boundaries, especially in a relationship, and you do not do anything that you or your partner is not comfortable with. Simple. Everyone can stick to that. Really important. We love it. But what I find tricky about this section is that it feels more like Kristen and Bethany are imposing their own boundaries onto other people rather than encouraging people to find out boundaries for themselves. And that's a bit of a problem. So it's hard to be completely on board with this. Again, if it's what the individual wants, I'm not gonna complain about it. A person saying, I set this boundary for myself, love it, wonderful. I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong. But Kristen and Bethany sitting here saying, you need to have this boundary and this and this, otherwise you're a dirty sinner who's going to hell. I'm just not really here for it, you know? I just think, it's important that I remind people that it's okay to have different boundaries from other people and it's okay to take time to figure out for yourself what you want and need them to be. There's no right or wrong, it's all good. I also find this line is particularly interesting. They say, boundaries are essential. They help us get to our end destination safely. I find this interesting for a reason that I am struggling a little bit to express. I guess to me, boundaries are essential, but they're like thing within themselves. They're an ongoing characteristic of a relationship, not a means to an end. Does that make sense? Because in my head there's a distinction and I can't quite figure out how to express this right. Boundaries are something ongoing that will grow and change with you and with your relationship and Boundaries are definitely something positive. They're to make sure you're safe and happy and fulfilled in the moment. I don't think boundaries, like they say, are to help us, I mean, they do help us be safe. Okay, oh, okay. They help us be safe rather than get somewhere safely. Does that make sense? So they're not just something you have to slog through for a while until you get to marriage and then that's it. You know, punishment over, go wild, you've reached your goal. That's where I think the distinction is. Kristen and Bethany write about boundaries like you impose them before you get married, you have to slog through them, they're a horrible thing, you fight against them, but you know, you, they know they're there to keep you safe and then in the end you get to marriage and then oh, all the boundaries are gone. Big party because you made it. Whereas I see boundaries as something ongoing and they're a wonderful thing and they help keep you continually safe. They're not just something that's pushing against you until you reach a destination, you know? And that is where I think I differ from Kristen and Bethany a lot. Throughout this book, they constantly talk about getting to the destination, the destination being marriage. But for me, it's not about a short journey and then marriage and then that's it. For me, 
it's all one big ongoing journey and oh wait I have a good metaphor for this give me a second to look this up okay so there's this thing in writing where quest adventure and journey are different things a quest is a trip to accomplish a specific task an adventure is a trip without a destination and a journey is when the trip is more important than the destination i think kristen and bethany see life and marriage and dating as a quest it's a trip to accomplish a task which is getting married and boundaries are there you fight against them until you accomplish that task. For me, I guess life and dating and relationships is more like a journey where the trip is more important than the destination and boundaries help you along that journey and make it more enjoyable and make it safe and make sure you're looked after while you're on that journey, you know? That's the difference. Does that make any sense? I do just think it's very telling of how they see, they seem to see boundaries as a necessary restriction with an end, but I see boundaries as quite a freeing and ongoing aid to life. Then again, they say something quite revealing, which is just another example of them seeing some data and coming to the wrong conclusions. So they say, not many Christian women get married and think, if only I'd kissed more guys in my past, or too bad I didn't sleep around more, or I should have looked at more porn. No way. The majority of Christian women we've interacted with don't wish they'd been less pure, they wish they'd been more pure. Setting up boundaries now will help you avoid this type of future regret. I do think this might well be true for a lot of people, but I also know for a fact there are some people who maybe they get married too young or to the wrong person, and they do absolutely regret not having dated more or experimented with their sexuality more or just explored their sexuality and who they are a little bit more first, you know, like before settling down. It's all down to the individual. I'm gonna keep saying it. There's no one right or wrong way to think about these things or have regrets or not. Two people getting married at 18 might have vastly different experiences where one regrets not having experienced more and the other's like, no, I'm very happy about this. Two people getting married at 40, one of them might think, oh, I've done too much. And the other one might think, oh, I'm glad I did all that, you know? And another one might think, hey, I've still not done enough. It, it's all down to the individual. There's no one right or wrong at all. But I also think it's important to remember that the kinds of Christian women that Kristen and Bethany know aren't gonna admit, especially not to these two, if they do have regrets like that when they get married. They're not gonna admit to it even if they do feel that way because purity culture like this makes women in particular feel ashamed of their sexuality in any context outside of a heterosexual monogamous marriage. Any regrets about not exploring their sexuality, any sexual thoughts, they're made to feel guilt, they're made to feel ashamed, they're made to feel impure and dirty. So they're not gonna admit to these things and that's a real shame. So while they're here saying, well, I've never heard of it, so it can't possibly happen, so... I think they're not seeing how skewed their data is and they're coming to the wrong conclusions. So once again, I'm gonna say, please ignore Kristen and Bethany. Do what is best for you. Think about what you want or what you don't want and not what is expected of you. If you want to wait until marriage because that's what's best for you, then great, you do that and more power to you. And if you don't want to, that is fine too, great more power to you. But you need to figure it out for yourself. And if you do find you wanna explore your sexuality a bit, whether that's with one partner or multiple partners or one gender or multiple genders or um, over a long period of time or a short period of time, or like anything in between, as long as it's safe and consensual and you're looking out for yourself and your emotional needs and your physical needs and you're really thinking through what you're doing and understanding yourself and learning from what's happening, that is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of and not something you are guaranteed to regret at all. In fact, you might find it makes you feel more fulfilled, it makes you feel happier. You might find that if you've experienced like a number of partners, you know exactly what you want in a future partner to settle down with more and you can end up with someone who is more suited to you. There's lots of positives to it if that's what's right for you. Basically, please don't ever feel ashamed. Just don't. Uh, then Kristen lifts lists off her own boundaries before marriage, which included, we won't discuss anything related to sex and intimacy until after our engagement and guided by our premarital counselor, which honestly seems slightly unhealthy to not even talk about, but okay. Like, I just, <sighs> if you're so sexually repressed that you can't even say to someone, hi, I'm comfortable with this, or I'm using this kind of birth control, or I'd really like our first time together to be like X, Y, and Z. If you're so sexually repressed that you can't talk like that 
on a mature level without fearing his penis is gonna slip into you, then it just, it just doesn't seem healthy and it doesn't seem like you're mature enough for a sexual relationship or marriage. I don't know. Um, and then they have other boundaries like we'll not watch any movies or TV shows that foster sexual arousal and lust. I'd love to know what is on their list of TV for that. One thing I will absolutely give them credit for, and this is something you do not see in many Christian relationship books, is that they actually seem pretty equal in terms of sharing responsibility between the man and woman in relationships for things like basically sexual urges. So they ask things like, what physical actions have the potential to be a temptation for me or him? This acknowledges that both men and women have sexual urges that they want to act on and both need to be responsible for their own urges. Normally when I read stuff like this, it's books about how men are sexual creatures and as women, we need to cover up and not tempt them because uh, they're not responsible for their own actions when, you know, we slip them a bit of shoulder or something. And it's quite refreshing to not see that here. They're not putting all the onus on the woman to not sexually arouse the man, they're saying, hey, both men and women can feel arousal and urges, take responsibility for your own feelings, which is very positive for Girl Defined. It shocks me that they think like this, but I'm very happy to see it, you know? Um, and then the last point is just seeking accountability, which is just about telling everyone exactly what kind of sex you're not having, so you can do that if you want. Oh, okay, we are getting through this, we are. We're nearly done, I promise. Our next chapter is 10 red flags to look for in a relationship. And I think by the title alone, this one has the potential to be really useful. Sadly, it's not really. <laughs> it opens with Bethany acknowledging quite rightly that sunk cost fallacy is a huge problem in some relationships, although she doesn't word it like that. She says, the red flags, i.e. concerns, problems, sin, issues, major character flaws, etc., were there in one of her past relationships, but I, Bethany, ignored them. I didn't want to believe that my hours upon hours of invested time could potentially come to an end. Instead of facing the facts and acknowledging the red flags in my relationship, I ignored them. So I think it's really good that she's pointing out that just because you spent a lot of time with someone, it doesn't mean you have to stay with them if you're not right together. It's actually a really like progressive thing from Girl Defined and I'm glad they said it. Now, they go on to list a bunch of red flags, uh, 10, I think, but a lot of these things are just like things that Kristen and Bethany have a personal dislike for. For example, not being religious enough. That's not really a universal red flag. That's just a personal preference. So, I don't know. I would say a red flag is something a lot more universal, which kind of almost always indicates someone won't be a good partner. So they do have a few genuine ones in here. For example, number four on their list, which is he pressures you to compromise sexually. This absolutely is a red flag, but not for the reasons Girl Defined say it is. They say, if a guy pressures you to compromise sexually, he is not showing you Christ-like agape love. He's not encouraging you towards purity and holiness. He's not striving to honor God in that area of the relationship, which I wouldn't really say is the problem there. The problem is when anyone pressures anyone sexually, it shows they don't respect your boundaries. They don't respect your body. They don't respect your personal space. They don't respect you and you won't be able to feel fully safe with them or trust them and that is a problem. I don't know why Girl Defined didn't mention that because it's huge. Um, and then there are other things that are pretty good, like they warn um, it's a red flag if he wants to keep the relationship a secret or if he's quick to anger or is self-obsessed and yeah, they're definitely red flags, so good on them for pointing them out. And then in the next chapter, Kristen starts to tell us how she knew Zach was the one for her. And while I personally don't think I believe in the one, um, and you know, there only being one right person for everyone forever for the rest of your lives, I do think it is important to ask yourself questions about whether your partner is right for you now or not. Their advice seems odd though, and maybe a little dangerous. Weirdly, they tell people not to ask, how do I know if he's the one for me? I wish I was joking. Like, ugh. Asking the question, how do I know if he's the one for me seems harmless at first glance, because it when we as Christian women ask the question in this way, we've instantly made the relationship all about us. We begin to view the guy through the lens of personal fulfillment. Will he make me happy? Do I feel fulfilled when I'm with him? Does he compliment me perfectly? Will he meet all my needs? Does he understand my every desire? Will he complete me? If you're constantly evaluating whether a guy is the perfect fit for you, you'll measure all his qualifications from a lens of selfishness. 
His worthiness will be completely dependent on how he serves you, how he meets your needs, how he makes you feel, what he has to offer you. You will place yourself at the center of the relationship, you'll be on a constant hunt for Mr. Perfectly Fits You in every way, and if you do find a man who's, who seems to meet all your needs, it will only be a matter of time before he sorely disappoints you. I would say it's bad to be only asking these questions and not also asking, what do I give to him? What can I offer him? How am I good for him or them or her or anyone? Like, you know what I mean. But it's not bad to ask these at all. Please ignore Kristen here. It is not selfish to ask, does your partner make you feel fulfilled and happy and comfortable and safe and have everything you need? It is absolutely okay and encouraged to look out for yourself, to want to be happy and to find someone who's right for you. That is not selfish at all. It's not selfish to feel fulfilled or happy with your partner. To say it is, is just bizarre. And again, I don't like to speculate too much on personal stuff, but it kind of feels to me like they're just trying to justify the fact that maybe they don't feel this way about their own relationships. So they're like, well, it doesn't really matter if he fulfills me and if I'm happy because ultimately God's happy. Mm. Um, and then the next point they make is to stop thinking about soulmates. Apparently they exist, but you shouldn't go looking for one. This part feels kind of muddled and odd, but in summary they make one good point, which is if you come up with a dream man in your mind, then no real man's ever gonna live up to him, and you'll be making constant comparisons, and you might miss out on someone great because they aren't exactly like your fantasy, which is a good point, but then they ruin it because instead of just pointing out that that's unhelpful for that reason, they say, this approach is often short-sighted, self-centered, and feelings-based in nature. Which just seems a bit cruel, isn't it? And I'm so over girl defined and their whole anti-feelings and emotions thing. It's very bizarre. Uh, they go on to say that the one and only correct approach is, instead of selfishly looking for someone to meet all your needs and fulfill your destiny, the right question to ask is, how do I know if he's the one I want to commit my life to? Which to me sounds like the same thing, but apparently it's different. Then they go straight back to calling everyone sinners again, which is Girl Define's favorite thing to do. And they say, since you're both imperfect sinners, you have to be willing to commit for better or for worse to selflessly loving this particular sinner until you die. And then they end with the summary of, get to know him. If you want to commit to him, you should probably marry him. And then we get the least romantic description of a wedding ever when Kristen talks about her own wedding. It just says it sounded a bit ominous, doesn't it? When we both said I do, we entered into a lifelong covenant before our families, friends, and most importantly, God. Never again would we have to wonder who the one was. Now we knew. It was official. For better or worse. And now it was our job to be faithful to the covenant. Like, it, it does sound ominous, doesn't it? That's not a happy wedding. Like, and if it was a happy wedding, write it as a happy wedding. <laughs> um, and now finally, let's zoom through the final part of the book, which is part five, living well on this side of the altar. And the last chapter we're gonna look, be looking at is chapter 17, because chapter 18 is basically basically just a summary of the rest of the book. There's no point going over it. So last chapter, let's do it. What married women want you to know? And this starts with a story about cow tipping. Now this is weird because they write more enthusiastically about cow tipping than anything else I've seen in this entire book. When they're asked if they want to go, our eyes widened with excited curiosity. No, Bethany said with raised eyebrows, but we've always wanted to try it. Let's do it! Kristen has never been this enthusiastic about her own wedding. Bethany has never been this enthusiastic about any of the men she's dated. Not even the one that she threw a shoe at. What is this level of excitement? Anyway, I didn't know what cow tipping was until I read this story, but apparently it is sneaking into a field and pushing over sleeping cows. Now they're teenagers when they do this, and I know people do stupid stuff as teenagers, but who the hell thinks it's fun to go and hurt animals while they're in a vulnerable state? Where is the enjoyment in there? How does that warrant this level of enthusiasm? Anyway, they got chased by a bull and their parents got mad at them. So now they think it was a bad idea. Not because they could have seriously injured some innocent vulnerable cows. There's no mention of that. They're just sad that they got into trouble. Anyway, the point of the story is just sometimes teenagers do stupid stuff and to stop you doing stupid stuff, you should get a mentor but only if your mentor is a white, Christian, heterosexual, married woman with children. And then they share some stories and advice from some of these women. And um, 
This one in particular I just find a bit bizarre. It, it, mm, it's very odd. Uh, so this one says, The first surprise, or rather shock, came when we'd only been married a few days. We'd just returned from our honeymoon and I'd taken all our clothes to the laundromat. I left the clothes in the washing machine and went shopping. When I returned to get our clothes, someone had stolen them. I drove back to our apartment and excitedly exclaimed, Bob, guess what? Someone's stolen all our clothes. But don't worry, you and I can go shopping and charge all the new clothes. He immediately said, I don't believe in charge accounts. I was shocked. How could you live without a charge card? I'm assuming that's a credit card, it's the American thing. He said, I think we should pray for some new clothes or some incredible bargain that fits our budget. I'd prayed for a godly man, but had assumed he would be one that fit in a little better with my financial policy. The Lord had to really help me get over that surprise, and I began looking for some incredible bargain. How are you so naive and unprepared for life that you let something like this happen after you're already married? I can see a kid living on their own for the first time at uni or something, like getting their clothes stolen, but if you're not mature enough to know how to do your own laundry, I don't think you're mature enough to get married. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's controversial, but you know. <laughs> this is why it's such a huge problem to go straight from living with your parents and being babied and having everything done for you to suddenly being married and having to do everything yourself and with no transition in between, you know? It <sighs> Close my mind. Same with the money thing here though. How do you not discuss finances before you marry someone? Seems like such a basic thing to me. And again, this is another reason why I will always and always, always advocate for living with someone before you marry them. Because if things don't work out, if you have really different values, if they turn out to be abusive, if you don't think you're a good fit together, if you have like very different I, I don't know, lifestyles, financial goals and issues and ways of dealing with things, like all of these different things. If you're not a good fit, you can still leave that relationship and get out without being legally tied to someone. And I know Christians like Kristen and Bethany are like, oh, but it's so bad that you can just leave at any time. And it's like, no, it's not, it keeps you safe. Um, and oh God, that, all this ranting without even touching on the issue that apparently here the man has all the financial power and control. And that is just a scary position to be in, isn't it? Um, and then the other women in the section just talk about stuff like how to prepare for marriage, you should take cooking and decorating classes. And then another one talks about how you should be okay with your husband spending money however he sees fit and you don't get a say and so on. And then like I say, the final chapter is just a, a summary of everything else in the book. So it's a bit dull, not really worth talking about. And that is it, we are done. Finally, thank God, okay. So I know some of the stuff we looked at today was really bad, but it was definitely not the worst part of the book. Not that that's really saying much. Um, but overall, I would say that even bearing the target audience in mind, this is a really, really, really terrible book. Do not recommend, don't go out and buy it, one out of 10. It's full of offensive stereotypes, homophobia, transphobia, harmful ad advice that will lead to people having self-esteem issues, being more likely to stay in abusive relationships, and just not taking care of themselves. And all of that I think is really, really bad. But I have been talking a lot, and my throat is starting to hurt a little bit now, so I'm gonna shut up, and I wanna ask what you guys think. Please let me know your thoughts and comments on everything we said in this video, everything we've looked at in this book overall, and just let me know your thoughts on um, if you wanna hear my poem soon, and um, generally what you think of the whole reproductive rights thing in general and what a mess it is. If you are interested, I do have a video on um, pro-choice, well, I have a couple of videos on pro-choice stuff, but my most recent one was looking at the terrible documentary that the LeBrant family made and going through it and kind of debunking all the bad science in it and the propaganda and the misinformation and all of that stuff. So if you are interested, please go check out that video. I worked really hard on it and I thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> Um, but for now, if you liked the video, it would be great if you leave a like, uh, leave a comment because it really helps with engagement and getting my videos seen by more people. If you're new here, it would be wonderful if you subscribe. And if you want to see more from me, then you can go follow me over on Instagram. I am posting lots of Glastonbury photos at the minute. I also post lots of pictures of Kyra. And on my stories, I post about books that I'm reading and fun stuff like that. So it would be wonderful to see you over there. Uh, you can find me at Rachel Oates with a zero and seven O because my name was taken and I'm annoying like that. And that is me done for today. I'm shutting up. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you guys' help a lot and I'll see you again really, really soon. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.